Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on uh, calcium signalling. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a more in-depth look at uh, the IP3 receptor, or the inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate uh, receptor. So, inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate um, receptor, or IP3 receptor. And basically, this is a receptor that we know is in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, or if it's a muscle cell, the, what's known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, and uh, that it responds to increases in IP3 level in the cytoplasm as a result of the inositide uh, signaling pathway, the phosphonositide signaling pathway. And... Um, when IP3 goes up in the cytoplasm, it's going to trigger this receptor to open. Well, actually, what we're going to see is it doesn't quite do that. We're going to see exactly what IP3 does to this receptor. And, um, but what it does do is it activates somehow the release of calcium from these intracellular stores. Okay, so the format for this video is we're firstly going to look at the structure of this receptor. Uh, then we're going to look at how it's actually activated. And then we're going to look at once it's activated, what does it do, i.e. what's its function? So let's start with its structure. So if we have a cell here, let's say this is a cell, then this receptor is found within the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum within our cell. And then uh, basically you find the IP3 receptor in um, this membrane here, like so. Uh, so here would be the IP3 receptor. Right, so that's where we find it. Now let's have a look at its structure. So let's take it out and have a look at its structure. So basically, its structure, it's made up of four subunits. So I will draw it as a big sort of pore uh, with four subunits, like so. Okay, so it's made up of these four subunits. And each one of these subunits is a separate polypeptide. So I'll divide it up into four, like so. And that's the hole down the middle, basically. So let's put a line down there. So these four portions that it's made up of, um, and um, each of them is a separate polypeptide. Now, um, there are three genes coding for subunits of the IP3 receptor. So this whole tetramer here is an IP3 receptor. But basically, uh, for, if you're deciding which subunit to you, which um, protein to use uh, to make up one of these quarters of this receptor, then there are three genes coding for um, proteins which you can use to make up these receptors, basically. And you can either make homotetramers, uh, which is where you use uh, the same protein uh, four times to make up the receptor. So in each one of these four sockets, you stick the exact same protein, i.e. encoded for by the exact same one of these three genes, basically. Or you can make heterotetramers, where basically uh, you mix and match. You don't use the same uh, gene uh, in all four sockets. You use slightly different proteins, but it still functions as a IP3 receptor. And IP3 receptors are extremely related to reanidine receptors. They're very similar structure, but the di main difference I would point to is that uh, reanidine receptors, you cannot make heterotetramers. You can only make homotetramers. In reanidine receptors, the four subunits, the four uh, proteins that you're putting into these four sockets had to be made by the same gene, either reanidine receptor 1, reanidine receptor 2, or reanidine receptor 3. So uh, that's the difference between uh, IP3 receptors and uh, reanidine receptors. Another difference, actually, is that these proteins that make up these quarters of these receptors, they're actually smaller than the reanidine receptors. We saw how, in the case of reanidine receptors, these, a single one of these proteins, which makes up a quarter of the whole receptor, had a size of about 5,000 amino acid residues, whereas these are smaller, basically. These are approximately uh, 2,750 amino acid residues, each one of them. So uh, the whole receptor would have four of those, so it would be um, have a larger weight. So 2,750 amino acids.
Right, okay, so that's the structure of the IP3 receptor. Um, right, so now let's discuss uh, its actual activation, basically. Okay, so this is how it's activated. So when IP3 goes up in the cytoplasm, so let's say IP3 has gone up in the cytoplasm, then on the cytosolic side of this IP3 receptor, so let's say this is the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and this side is the ER lumen over here, and on the other side, therefore, is the cytoplasm. So basically, if IP3 goes up in um, goes up in the cytoplasm. So how should I draw IP3? So um, let's just draw it as a hexagon to denote those six carbons, and then I'll stick some circles off the side to denote the phosphate group. So here is IP3. So this is the first phosphate group, then the fourth, and then the fifth. So inositol 145 trisphosphate. Okay, so basically, um, if IP3 goes up in the cytoplasm, and I'll give it a little bit of a colour in, so let's have IP3 denoted by pink here. Yeah. If IP3 goes up in uh, the cytoplasm, what's going to happen is that there are IP3 binding sites on each of the subunits of this IP3 receptor. So we have four uh, proteins making up this IP3 receptor. Each of them has an IP3 binding site. Okay, so where shall I denote that? So I will put the IP3 binding here, and I'll just denote it by a hexagon now because it's a little, going to get a little squash otherwise. So basically, IP3 binds to some IP3 binding site on the cytosolic side of um, each of these IP3 uh, receptor subunits, basically. Okay, so we've got... Uh, four molecules of IP3 now bound to this IP3 receptor, one to each receptor subunit, basically. So let me just finish colouring them in. So here they are. And basically, IP3 does not, repeat, does not trigger this IP3 receptor to open. Instead, what it does is it changes the conformation of this receptor to make available uh, a stimulatory calcium binding site, basically. So once these four IP3 molecules are bound here, what happens is that um, a new binding site appears. So you change conformation and you make available a new binding site here. So let's say these are the binding sites. And basically, uh, they, these binding sites are for calcium. So I will colour them in orange. So these are now a new binding site that was not available before IP3 bound. And this is a stimulatory calcium binding site. Okay, so stimulatory calcium binding site. Okay, so um, now what has to happen is that calcium ions have to come and bind to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, basically. And when calcium ions come and bind to those stimulatory uh, calcium binding sites, that will cause uh, the activation of um, the activation of the IP3 receptor. So when four calcium molecule uh, calcium ions uh, now come in and bind to these calcium binding sites, so I'll show a calcium ion here. So let's say this is a calcium ion here. Okay, so a calcium ion is going to come and bind to each one of these stimulatory calcium binding sites. So four calcium ions are going to come in overall. And when that happens, finally the IP3 receptor will open. And then it will allow calcium to move through. So really the IP3 receptor is a coincidence detector. It needs two signals in order to activate. It needs IP3 to go up and bind to it, and it then also needs calcium to go up, so it's actually acting as a coincidence detector. And we're going to see how that's actually potentially important in cerebellar granule cells and long-term depression in cerebellar, um, oh sorry, cerebellar Purkinje cells and long-term depression of the links between cerebellar granule cells and cerebellar Purkinje cells. Okay, so, um, so overall, IP3 has to bind, and then calcium is going to bind to the, this newly available calcium stimulatory binding site, and that will cause the receptor to open. If you just 
uh, expose these IP3 receptors to calcium without IP3, then there won't be available a calcium stimulatory binding site, and instead there is thought to be available a calcium inhibitory binding site, which is covered up by the binding of the IP3. So in fact, IP3 does two things. It creates a calcium, uh, a stimulatory calcium binding site and removes an inhibitory calcium binding site. Okay, uh, so if IP3 is not there, then the calcium signal will not trigger the opening of this IP3 receptor. So it needs those two signals to arrive together. Right, okay, so now we've discussed its activation, let's get on to its function. So what's going to happen now is that this IP3 receptor is going to adopt an open conformation and it will allow calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum to leave the endoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm. Now, calcium levels are quite high within the endoplasmic reticulum and very low within the cytoplasm. So, there is a calcium gradient going out of the endoplasmic reticulum. So, overall, you're going to get a net movement of calcium out through this channel. Um, the endoplasmic reticulum does not have an electrical potential difference across it, so it's neutral. The cytosolic electrical potential is the same as the endoplasmic reticular lumen uh, electrical potential, so there's no electrical driving force driving calcium out, so the only driving force is the concentration driving force. Now, if I draw a cross-section of this channel, what it pretty much looks like is, if I draw the um, uh, phospholipid bilayer there, then it has a narrowing towards the ER lumen, basically, which is the selectivity filter. However, just like in the case of reanidine receptors, this selectivity filter is rubbish, basically. It's not very selective at all. So this is basically a cross-section of this channel. I've cut it in half, and I'm looking um, at what it looks like side-on, basically. Okay, so this is the IP3 receptor here. Right, and the I'm looking at it as a whole channel, so I'm not looking at a single subunit now, I'm looking at the entire pore forming channel. Okay, right. So this narrowing, which is on the ER lumen side here, um, this narrowing is called the selectivity filter. However, unlike usual selectivity filters, it's not actually that selective at all. It's, um, it allows calcium ions to go through it without giving up the hydration shell. So basically, the calcium ion can remain, if I draw a calcium ion like here, this is our calcium ion, the calcium ion can remain with water molecules surrounding it. So that's uh, known as its hydration shell, basically. Because water is a polar molecule with oxygen slightly negatively charged. Oxygen coordinates around the calcium ion, like so and creates what's known as a hydration shell around the calcium ion. Okay, uh, so usually when ions go through ion channels, they have to give up their hydration shell. But in the case of this um, um, IP3 receptor, um, calcium can go through without removing its hydration shell. Now, that means that this selectivity filter cannot be very selective at all, because if you think about this, it's letting an ion go through with a hydration shell all around it. How on earth does the channel know which ion is at the centre of that huge, great complex, basically? All the channel can see is just a bunch of water molecules surrounding something that's at the centre. It can't see the ion, basically, so it can't tell what ions are going through, and in fact, this channel isn't very selective at all. It allows calcium to move through it, it also allows potassium to move through it, um, and those are the main ions that are important because, as, I, as you know, uh, potassium is very high in the cytoplasm. Sodium is very, very low, so we don't need to worry about sodium moving through here. Potassium is the important one, and then calcium is very high in the ER lumen. So calcium and potassium are going to be the main things that are moving through this channel simply because they're the only things that are there. Okay, so what overall happens is that you get calcium moving out just by probability and chance, because if you've got a very high concentration of calcium on this side, let me denote this by loads of pink dots, if you've got a very high concentration of calcium on this side, and a low concentration of calcium on this side, then the simple chance of a calcium ion uh, from this side hitting this channel pore and it happening to go through is much bigger than the chance of a calcium ion hitting the pore from this side and going through. So you're going to get a net movement of calcium out. Similarly, you've got a very high concentration of potassium on this side, 
And you've also got quite a high potassium concentration inside as well. It's not very different from the potassium concentration in the cytoplasm. There's not a concentration gradient of potassium across the ER membrane. However, when you start moving calcium out through this channel, calcium carries a positive charge. So what's going to happen? You're gradually going to be making the cytoplasm more positive and the ER lumen more negative. So you're going to build up an electrical potential difference across this membrane. You're going to raise the electrical potential of the cytoplasmic side and lower the electrical potential of the ER lumen side. That's not good because calcium has a positive charge. It likes to be um, in areas of lower electrical potential. So gradually, as this electrical potential builds up, calcium is going to start being pulled back into the ER lumen and it's not going to want to move out anymore even though the concentration uh, gradient is still um, favoring movement out. The electrical gradient is going in the opposite direction basically and eventually what would, would happen is they'd meet an equilibrium, a nernst equilibrium. However, what stops that from happening is that this potassium acts as the counter ion. As this electrical potential builds up, what happens is that potassium ions are going to start moving in to the ER lumen because they also have a positive charge and they want to be in the area of lower electrical potential. So they start moving in and that balances the charge movement of the calcium out basically and stops the building up of the electrical potential any further. So potassium basically acts as the counter ion to the movement of uh, calcium and that's really important because if it didn't, eventually you build up an electrical potential difference across the ER membrane which would stop the movement of calcium out and uh, would terminate your signal basically. Okay, so that's all for this video. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll look at how IP3 receptors can be used as coincidence detectors and how this is important in long-term depression in cerebellar Purkinje cells.